Welcome to Dill's History Part 8. I will start my talk with a few old stories, some of which are in and around Brewer Street, and what have been remembered in word by my father Jim Scarden of 6 Brewer Street Deal, fishmonger, poulterer and boatman. I will try not to bore you too much. Again, pictures will pass by randomly and will not be in conjunction with the story being told. As like most of these old time stories, pictures are scarce of the subject being spoken about. But I have included many old pictures of Deal as it used to be. Hopefully, this will give you a small insight into a few remembered true accounts which took place during the early 20th century. I start with a short recollection of my great grandfather, who was still alive when I was a young un. Robert George Thomas Scarden, known as Bob, my great grandfather, who started the Scarden's North Dill Band and Hooden Horse, which frequented the streets of North Dill way back in the early 1900s. Bob and his bandsmen raised money for the poor of North Dill. This ensured that the less fortunate had food and money at Xmas and were to some extent able to feed their families. Bob also had boats at the marina and lived in Sandown Road near the fish factory where at one period in the 1800s he had a laundry which was used to take the washing in from the barracks. The property was hit by a bomb during the Second World War and the main building was destroyed, but some parts of interest still remained when I was a young boy and helped my father on the land there. The ground was used after this period as an allotment where my father had hens for eggs and grew vegetables and sold them at the gate. Bob also had a cat boat called the Straightforward, which was built at a cost of £90 in the late 1800s. This was stationed on the beach at the marina, just along from Enfield Road. The vessel was used mainly during the year for smuggling purposes, in order to raise money to help the poor in bad times. The Coast Guards, who were in with the smuggling then, informed him on one particular occasion that the Tin Tac this is what the customs and excise from Dover were known as, were coming and told him to get away with the contraband that had just been landed in the straight forward. He had a fair quantity of tobacco and brandy on board. Bob left with his cartload of contraband and made headway on the Canterbury Road for the Anchor Inn at Littlebourne, which is where he sold his contraband that he had with him. The anchor that hung over the Anchor Inn at Littlebourne was taken out by Bob Scarden on his fish barrow in 1901 and has hung above the door there ever since. It has over the last couple of years however been taken down. Bob made just over £90 from his smuggled goods and on his return to Dill he was greeted by the customs men who were standing by the straight forward which to Bob's surprise was lying on the beach in two sections having been sawn in half by the customs officials. When Bob spoke about this to us as youngsters, he laughed and said, well, it cost me £90 to have the boat built and I got just over £90 back for the goods, so I can't complain. The two halves of his lugger were drawn down Enfield Road and set upon his land in Sandown Road, where they remained for many years as sheds. Remnants of these were still in situation when my father Jim Scarden sold the land in the 1960s. It was common practice in the old days for anyone caught smuggling to have their boat sawn in half if they were caught with contraband and the North End of Dill was, even when I was a young'un, a sight to witness. There were many halves of boats on allotments and people's gardens, upturned and made into sheds. The consequences of smuggling was not deterred and went on for many years after until the decline of the boats from Dill Beach in the 1980s.
my great grandfather on my grandmother's side, Isaac Gammon Hayward, who was at one period Mayor of Deal and who once lived and worked in the Time Ball Tower as watchmaker, also contributed money to the poor. In the early to mid 1900s, the Deal Council issued what was called bread and soup tickets. They would go to the town hall on Wednesday and Saturday and tickets were issued to the needy for bread and soup. These tickets were taken to Oatridge's, which was then the quarter deck. This was the baker's where the poor got their bread with a ticket. And the second place a ticket could be used was the soup kitchen, which then was in Brewer Street, opposite number three, where the Willis brothers resided. My father always told me that when he was young he used to go in and help stoke the fire underneath the coppers where the soup was made. The coppers were set on brick floors and bones for the soup were delivered in hessian sacks. As youngsters my father and his friends used to help by putting the bones in the coppers and he said that on many occasions rats that were scare in the area were caught and thrown into the coppers with the other contents but people apparently not known of what these young uns had done were none the wiser. They enjoyed the soup which was served them, although my dad always said he would never eat it. Are you all my the soup was free to those with tickets, but was also available to the ordinary person at a penny a quart. No mean sum in the early to mid 1900s. The soup kitchens served the town for many years and were pulled down after the war. In 1950, when I was a boy, there was a crude shelter built on the land in Brewer Street where the soup kitchen once stood. And my mother, amongst others, placed their cars here at a small charge for safety. Sadly, this now has been turned into a modern building plot and a house has been placed on the grounds where the soup kitchens once stood. Number 6 Brewer Street was in the Scarden family for many years. I was raised there. At the rear of the building was what we called the stables. They were once used for horses when fish was drawn by horse and cart. But in later years the stables were converted into what we called the smoke hole. Herring hangs for those landlubbers that are unfamiliar with fishing names. A large cold store was also installed in the smoke hole during the 1950s. This was removed when my father sold Number 6 Brewer Street and had a new house built on his farm in Albert Road. The hangs were a sight to behold during the herring season, with hundreds of spits of herring hanging from the looms. Many thousands of herrings were smoked here in this building and turned into bloaters, which were very popular with the local people. A notice was always put on the gate to let the townsfolk know when the next batch of bloaters would be ready. People would queue down the street every time the bloaters were ready for sale in order to get theirs before we sold out. Sawdust which was used for smoking the fish was brought in by lorry from Holman's a sandwich and put in the cellars of number 6 Brewer Street. So much was delivered it almost touched the floor of the rafters. The sawdust consisted of mainly oak with a mixture of other hardwood dust, the mix of which remains a family secret. This was used with logs during the smoking process. Herrings were salted in big baths of brine, then run on to spits, spitted up as we called it, and from there they would be skilled out onto spits and placed down the length of the yard to dry in the wind before being hung in the smoke hole, where they were smoked from one to two days or more, depending on the weather. They were ready once they turned a golden brown and were delicious cooked or raw, far better than the fish sold these days that's cured with artificial flavours. Herrings were supplied to my father by George Raleigh, whose boats were alongside the Royal Hotel, where the car park now stands. Also Ben Bailey, who was just south of the pier, and whose netting boat was the teddy bear. Herring in those days were sold by the number, not weight, and went like this. There were four herrings to the warp, and thirty warp to the hundred. That's 120 herrings. This was known as a long hundred, as herrings with damaged gills could not be run onto spits for smoking. 
damaged herring were called tie tails and were hung on iron spits by the tails. They still tasted the same though, but were sold cheaper. 1,000 herring made a cran basket, and 10 cran, which is 10,000 herring, made a last. No herring were ever sold by the stone. As well as herring, sprats, cod, peltin, and other varieties of fish were also cured, as also was pork that was bred and reared on father's farm at Albert Road. Nothing tasted better than a bit of home cured ham. In 1956, at the age of nine, when I caught my first herring in my dad's punt, the Mary Ann, I earned three shillings a hundred. That was a long hundred, a good sum for a young'un. The Mary Ann was a 15 foot punt and was bought in the early 1950s by my father. She was taken to Six Brewer Street and rebuilt and she was sold in the late 1960s and ended up on Warmer Beach, being owned by Derek Goodman. Where she is now, I have no idea. Tommy Upton's boats and bathing machines were at the top of Brewer Street, from whence I spent much of my childhood. When Tommy Upton passed the bar in 1950s, his boats were sold off. One particular boat, which Tommy owned, was originally a Kingsdown boat. She was, during a severe storm, picked up and thrown on top of a shed, and being severely damaged on the starboard side, she was rebuilt by a carpenter. The job was not neat, but affected its duty, and she was renamed the who'd have thought it. Tommy Upton then bought her and renamed her the Mini Ha Ha. On Tommy's passing, Bob Abel bought the Mini Ha Ha and she was used mainly for angling parties. It was when she was out fishing on one occasion she came to grief in the groins. This was in the late 1950s. I can't remember exactly what happened but she had engine failure while steaming up along shore from the bay. Being almost a total wreck, Bob Abel was going to burn her but she was saved by my father Jim, who bought her for the sum of five pounds. From here, in a total derelict state, she was loaded on a trailer and taken to my father's land in Albert Road, Court Marsh Farm, which is near the old potteries, almost where Hutchins Timber Yard now stands. Here the boat was rebuilt and she was duly renamed the Fair Chance. This boat has had many adventures and many stories surround her while my father owned her and I operated her commercial fishing and with angling parties. She was eventually sold in 1968 at auction opposite the Timeball Tower to a miner and now many years on she lies in a poor, derelict state in the Deal History and Maritime Museum in St George's Road. Returning to Brewer Street, at the top on the corner was the pub called the Sydney Smith. My father said when he was a young'un he used to take a jug over to the pub and get it filled with beer for his father. This cost fourpence a pint. Like most kids, he'd take a sip on the way back home to see what it tasted like, but always denied having done so when asked. In Middle Street was the Five Bells, another pub which he used to go to with a jug for beer. Good old days, now gone. After the Second World War, the beach was still thriving with boats and boatmen from Sandown Castle to Kingsdown. Some of those old salts that I remember from those days on Dill Beach were Tommy, Harry and Freddie Upton, Bill Bailey, Johnny Revel, George Foy, known as Bubbles, Matt Oil and Bill Oil, Frank Preston, Togo Harris, Johnny Budd, Alf May, Dr Bailey, Bummer Williams as he was called, Bill, George and Dick Riley, Suet Ambrose, he later became the local milkman and was delivering milk to the community from Dola Dairies in Brewer Street. He always knocked on the door at number 6 Brewer Street around 4am and had a tipple. 
And also there was George Baker, known as Frenchy, Jack Atwater, Claire Hickman, Alf Betts and many, many more that I could talk about for hours. Sadly, these men and Dill Beach as we knew it, no longer exists. The beauty of the boats lying in the length of the foreshore, with the old salts dressed in navy blue with their unmistakable hats on, sitting on their beach boxes, smoking a pipe and telling the visitors a yarn or two, has gone forever. We look at the seafront and beach now, and it's desolate, apart from the unsightly miniature breakwater wall that was built along its length. This is all that confronts you. One can only stare out to sea and recall those old days, when the Downs was a bustling hive of activity and ships, and boats could be seen to the horizon. You had to have been part of those old days to get a real insight into Deal as it was, a town of great history, great deeds and even greater men, now all lost and mostly forgotten, a bleak and dull beach, a town with depressing parking charges and wardens waiting to fine you for not paying parking fees, a place, if I were a visitor, I would not stop to visit. Remember the past and the good times, these are what Deal was and hopefully will never be forgotten for. Thank you for watching another part of my history of Dill in Kent, England. I hope this gives you an insight as to how things were in the old days and how they have changed. If you do decide to visit Dill, take a moment to stare out to sea and reflect the past. You might even see an old salt in his boat coming ashore.